Hey, I want to welcome all of our locations and everyone joining us online. Come on, Fredericksburg, would you help me welcome every location? Everybody joining us on our online stream. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Birch and I serve on our staff team leading worship at our Richmond location. So shout out to the mighty Richmond campus. Well, God is on the move at our campus. So excited about what the Lord is doing down south in Richmond. And before I go any further, I just want to give honor to our pastors, pastors Daniel and Tammy. Grateful for you, grateful for your ministry, for your life. You know, uh, moves of God like this are built off of a lot of people. But in the middle of a move of God, there's a couple that's leading the way, and that's the two of you. And I'm grateful uh, to do life with you guys, to, to hold your arms up, and to be able to bring the word uh, in, your pre- in your place. And so grateful for you. Love you so much. Come on, let's make some noise for our pastors. They're amazing. Come on, we got great pastors. I also just want to take a moment just to draw your attention to Easter. Come on, we're only a few Sundays away. Anybody excited about Easter at Life Point? Come on, we get to celebrate the risen Savior. Be thinking about who you're going to be bringing with you to our Easter experiences. We're opening up services at multiple times at every location. You don't want to miss an opportunity to be with someone in service. I'm telling you, church will feel a whole lot different when you got someone sitting next to you that you're believing for God to move in their life in a powerful way. So be thinking about Easter uh, being uh, March 30th and March 31st. Choose a location, uh, choose a campus and a time that's best for your friend, best for your family member to be a part of. Can't wait to see you guys there. And also something that's really incredible, exciting. It's on my heart. It's April 12th. We're having a live recording for LifePoint Worship's next record. Come on, somebody. It's going to be an incredible time. Hey, I want you to go ahead and mark your calendars April 12th. And today at 5 p.m., tickets, free tickets, are going live for you to register for the live recording. Now, here's what I got to tell you. It won't hurt my feelings if you pull your phone out right now and uh, make a reminder or set, a, set an alarm because those tickets will go quickly. And so just, just plan on being there. Uh, get your ticket as soon as you can. And uh, when, when you come to this live recording, just come ready to meet with the Lord. It's, it's not going to be exactly like a, a night of worship, but we are going to press in. There's going to be some different details and things that are happening in the context of the night, and we'll walk you through it. But we're going to meet with God. Yeah, we believe that the Lord has given us songs for this season that are going to push the church's worship culture forward. And we believe it's going to go outside of the walls of this church and start touching a lot of people all over the country and all over the world. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're in the middle of a series called The Character of a King, and I get to bring a message today about the Jesus who serves. The Jesus who serves. If you got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 34. We're going to dive into scripture together. The Bible says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or to my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Come on, let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We pray that you bless it, that it would speak 
to us, that, that we wouldn't just read the word, but it would begin to read us and transform us and shape us and change our hearts. We're, we're open, God. We, we come with a fresh mind, fresh thinking, a willingness to hear your word and to be doers of your word. And so would you move among us as we dive into your scripture? We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen, amen. Hey, this time of the year is a, is a lot of fun for the Paul family, but it's also very, very busy. You know, beginning of the year, January to through March is basketball season. And um, we got all three boys on a basketball team. I'm coaching two of the three teams and I have no life. Uh, I, we, we've got basketball about five days a week. We've got practices, we've got games. It's, it's basketball nonstop, not just NBA and college, but I'm talking about youth sports. I'm coaching a six-year-old and seven-year-old team and a seven, eight-year-old team. I'm talking about the little ones that can't stop double dribbling and can't stop traveling. If they get hit with the ball, they're in tears. I'm telling you, it is a labor of love, but it is labor for sure. Uh, but we love it. We love it. The, the boys love it. They're having a blast. They're, they're getting their form and they're, they're loving the game. They're keeping me up all hours of the night wanting to watch basketball on TV. I never realized that I'd have three boys that had such a love for the sport like I did. And it's awesome when you've got boys, you know, you have these, you got a built-in basketball team. But no one ever told me that they would all play on different teams with different practice uh, schedules. And, but it's awesome. The thing that's, that's great about coaching these, uh, these youth basketball teams that you get to teach a lot of fundamentals. You get, to, you get to inspire. You get to be their first coach. You really are the person that helps them develop a love for the game later on in life. But the thing about these kids is that every last one of them thinks they're Steph Curry. <laughs> Steph Curry is shooting shots from half court and he's draining them. And these kids walk into the gym and I mean, before they've even stretched, they're launching three-point shots. It's mostly air balls and a ton of bricks. And none of these kids want to do layups. They, they don't want to use the backboard. They don't want to do the fundamentals. They don't want to reverse pivot. They all want to shoot like Steph Curry. Steph Curry, you broke basketball. <laughs> However, the thing I love about Steph Curry is that he's not just all shooting. I got a chance to, uh, to watch uh, one of his pregame warmups, just like a bunch on YouTube. And if you're a basketball lover, I encourage you to, to find some of those. It's about a 15 to 20 minute pregame warmup. And Steph Curry, contrary to the popular belief of my seven and eight year olds, does more than shoot threes. He actually begins the first 10 minutes of his workout inside the painted area, like really close to the basket, shooting layups, using the backboard, hook shots, little runners, and everything he does starts from the inside and then begins to move to the outside. And because he knows if he wants to shoot lights out from behind the arc, he's got to be automatic on the inside. It's, he gets his feel for the basket. He gets touch. It's, it's where he gets his form. It's where he gets his rhythm. He works from the inside out. It's kind of counterintuitive. Most people think about Steph Curry because he's always shooting these outside shots, but his game is actually starting on the inside. It goes to the outside. It, it made me start thinking about these counterintuitive ways that we grow and learn. How many of you have ever had a teacher that to be able to better understand a lesson or a subject in, in class, they made you teach the lesson? Anybody ever had, had a teacher like that? I mean, teachers who do that, y'all are brilliant because it just engages a different part of the brain and makes you think about the lesson in a new way. You're not just trying to pass a test, but you're trying to transfer information and knowledge. And therefore you start to absorb it a whole lot differently. It's, it's like teaching to learn. You don't think that you would learn that well that way, but it really just engages your mind com completely different. It's counterintuitive. It's, it's, it's kind of like, a, like learning how to say no. You, you, th you think sometimes if you say no to everything, you lose opportunities or you miss out on, on some of the, the great things that uh, are happening in, in your social life or in your job or in your college. You might miss out if you say no, but sometimes when you learn how to say no, you clarify your purpose. When you learn how to say no, you, you begin to remove distractions of what you could be doing and you start to focus on what you should be doing. You know, it's kind of like being like a flood lamp or a laser. You know, a flood lamp will keep a pizza hot, but a laser can cut through steel. It's the focus. It's, it's removing the distractions. It's removing the things that aren't aligned with my purpose and my vision and my values and learning how to say no to those things so I can give a great yes. 
It's counterintuitive. It doesn't seem like it makes sense, but it really does help this new counterintuitive inside out thinking. I, 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 I think about, uh, I think about uh, creativity. You know, I'm an artist. I love to write songs. A lot of times people think you got to have all of the resources available to you to be able to be creative. But creativity actually comes from lack and not excess. You know, like I've, I've seen my kids draw amazing pictures, the ones that actually make it to the fridge, because not everything makes it to the fridge. <laughs> but the ones that usually make it to the fridge or they're the most creative are not the ones that they had the entire crayon box to use. It's the one where they only were given two or three or four colors and they had to use shading and combining colors. And it's actually their lack that created more creativity. It's, it's, it doesn't seem like it would work that way, but it really does. It, it made me think about Jesus. You know, uh, he, Jesus has what we call an upside down kingdom. He begins to unpack this to his disciples because James and John start to make a request to Jesus on their way to Jerusalem. Prior to, to Mark chapter 10, Jesus predicts his death for the third time to his disciples. And James and John are starting to think, well, if he is going to be, if he's going to pass away soon, let's go ahead and just call shotgun on what's happening in the next life. Let's, let, let me go ahead and just put in my request for a place of glory, for a place of influence, for an opportunity to sit at the right hand or to the left hand. I wanna be the one to go ahead and get my, my name thrown into the hat before he's gone. And Jesus then unpacks this counterintuitive pathway towards greatness that none of the disciples were ready for in verse 42 through 44. Jesus called them to him and said, I, I feel like Jesus in this moment is kind of like a, like a coach. He's like, come on, bring it in, team. Take a knee. He calls them in and says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. You know that. You've experienced it. You've seen it from a distance up close. They lord it, they lord it over them. And in their, their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. This seems like because we have the benefit of, of history and reading and, and understanding the, 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 the totality of scripture in, in some regard, it seems pretty elementary to us, but to the disciples, and I believe even to, even to some of us today, this is revolutionary thinking, that the ones who are great or the ones that lord over them, that that is to be looked at with not as much glory or with much admiration. He says, not so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be a servant. Jesus turns the entire hierarchy of the system on his head, where once the leader at the top would be served by all. He says the greatest among you should be at the bottom and be the servant to all. That means the higher you desire to go, the lower you must posture yourself. It's revolutionary thinking. I mean, Jesus has been doing this kind of thinking since day one. I mean, think about it. When he, was, when he was born, he wasn't born in a castle. He was born in a cave. You know, the birth announcement that would normally be sent to kings was sent out to shepherds. You know, the God of the universe strips himself of all of his glory and clothes himself in flesh appearance to walk among us. This is, this is the complete opposite of what they would have expected for a ruler or for a king. But that's the character of our king. Mark 10, 45 says, even the son of man, this is beautiful because Jesus starts to give them, he gives them a little bit of game right here. He tells them, you're, you're not gonna be, if you wanna be great, you gotta be a servant. If you wanna be the, the greatest among, you gotta, get, you gotta be the least among. But he even doubles down by saying, it's not just about you. This is how I'm doing it. Even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, as followers of Christ, it's our mandate to imitate the ways of Jesus. And that means being a servant. However, like the disciples, we hunger for glory, don't we? The, the Bible says that when the other 10 heard James and John calling shotgun, they began to become indignant with them. And 
When I first read this scripture, my initial thought is thinking, some of them are saying, man, how could you ask a question like that? What, that's such a dumb question to ask. Like, you, you should be humble. You should, you should put yourself last. No, the, the indignation that was coming out of the disciples was the fact that they called shotgun before they had a chance to. It's like when you're walking out the grocery store when you were a kid and you're, and you're with uh, one of your parents and, some, and you're, the first person that sees the car gets to say, I'm sitting up there for, that's how the disciples were feeling at that moment. It wasn't out of of a humility or a correction. It was out of jealousy that they themselves wanted that same place. They wanted that same seat of honor because we all long for a little bit of glory. We long for some glory. Everyone wants to be exalted in some ways. I mean, you think about it, because I know I do. It's, you think about that chair behind that desk, inside of that office, in the corner, on the top floor. Come on now. We're thinking about being the one in charge, being the leader, having the influence. Everyone wants to lead. I mean, everyone wants to lead and everybody wants to tell you how to lead. I mean, if, if you just spend a little bit of time on the internet, you're going to find a leadership conference or a leadership guru, a leadership course. You know, what's funny is that there's never any fellowship conferences or courses or gurus. I feel like I want to host my own leadership conference one day and just make it all about following. And hopefully no one will walk out in the first few minutes of my opening lecture. But no one, everyone wants to lead. Everyone wants to lead. Everyone wants a piece of that. We all do. We want a piece of that glory. It's because glory brings recognition. People recognize you, and, and if you have some recognition, it brings some power, and man, power is attractive. And there's a fight inside of each one of us, especially those who are in Christ, to battle against a desire to exalt ourselves when we, should, we are called to lower ourselves over and over again. My proposition to you today is the proposition of Jesus is that it's better to serve, it's better to serve. First Peter chapter 4, uh, 10 through 11 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If you speak, you should do it as one who speaks the word of God. If you, if you serve, then you should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I love this. Serving acknowledges the faithfulness of God. Each one of you that you should use whatever gift that you have received, God, God is faithful to give gifts. So whenever you serve, it acknowledges the faithfulness that God has inside of him to give you gifts. It, it also strengthens your relationship with God. You, you, should, uh, you should do so with the strength that God provides. As you serve, God brings you close and gives you strength to serve. And as you serve, you get God's strength. And when you're low, he pulls you close again. It's this cycle of God's strength and God pulling you close. And what a good God we serve. And it also ser serving points people to God. All, in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I love, I love this. I love this because we have stories like this every Sunday, day in and day out from families all over the church that have been touched by people who want to serve. The, the Hawkins have this amazing story. I, 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 I love telling stories because I could talk to you about this all day long, but there's, there's lives being touched here. This, this is a cool story. Check this out. They came to Life Point as a last resort to save their marriage. Come on, any, anybody identify with that? Like you're, you're giving God a, your last shot. You're, you're on your, the last ditch effort. And they came to Life Point to save their marriage. They were a blended family, both military, had lots of things to work on. They heard Pastor Daniel talk about giving a year of their life to being fully committed. And they thought they didn't have anything to lose since they were on the brink of divorce and about to file for bankruptcy. But both Amanda and Mark said yes to Jesus that same day. They got baptized every day, uh, that, that very day. Uh, they joined a small group, eventually joined the Kids Point team. After a while, they, they, uh, they led a small group. They became leaders within the Kids Point team. That year changed everything for them. Their marriage was not just saved, but strengthened. They got their finances in order by being obedient to the tithe, and their whole lives have been tr radically transformed. Come on, come on. That's amazing. You know, the beautiful piece of that 
is in the midst of that story, there was somebody who was serving by sharing the word. There's somebody that's serving on the baptism team. There's someone that's serving in Kids Point. There's a small group leader serving. I mean, there's just story and testimony over and over and over of how serving changes things. And it's better to serve. It's better to serve. I just feel like so many of us hold on to whatever it is that we call to be comfortable or safe in our lives. And that's what holds us back from serving, from pouring our lives out, from giving ourselves to Jesus. But I love what Mark 8, 35 says this. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, for the sake of the good news, you will save it. You want to know what living is? It's dying to yourself. It's giving of yourself. It's serving. It's, see, when you serve, you get to see the potential in somebody else that no one ever realized. You get to make the difference in someone's life. You get to dig deep as God unlocks purpose and plan in that person's life. Listen, it's not about status or money. I know, I know sometimes we think if we could just achieve these things or experience these things, we would finally be full of fulfillment and joy and peace. But listen, if it were, Billionaires wouldn't be depressed. Celebrities wouldn't self-delete. It's not about that. It's not about that. You see, when a person who serves, they find fulfillment that a drug can't match. <laughs> they find something that money can't buy and status cannot elevate to. It's better to serve. It is better to serve. Somebody say it's better to serve. It's better to serve. And I, I think Jesus shows us by the testimony of his life and ministry, that there's three particular ways in which it's better to serve. Come on, can we, you guys excited to dig into this today? Yeah. Come on, is this good so far? Yeah. Amen, all right. So the first way, the first way is it's, Jesus faithfully served the Father. It's better to serve one. It's better to serve one. Over and above everyone and everything, Jesus served one, the Father. Luke chapter two, verses 41 through 49 says this. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast had, was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went on the day's journey. But then, they be, that, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Okay, I'm not trying to say that Mary and Joseph are bad parents. <laughs> but if like an angel showed up to you, talking about you have this baby and he's going to be the savior of the world, I would just encourage you, don't lose Jesus. <laughs> don't lose Jesus. <laughs> Where's the savior? Oh, my son. So the Bible continues on, it says, and uh, verse 46, and after three days, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and making and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answer. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great, in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? That he, 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 I must be in my father's house. Jesus was showing us that it's better to serve God. You know why it's better to serve God? It's because God doesn't change. God is unchanging. Man's desires, people's desires change. Leadership changes, political leaders change, your teachers change, your authorities change. People come and go. But when you put your faith in God and not man, and when you serve God, not man, you have the confidence in his consistency. See this, if we could get this, this would solve church hurt. This would solve church hurt. Because church hurt, what we describe as that is really just people hurt in disguise. It's somebody that I put my hope in and my faith in, a person who's broken and sinful and 
regular, just like me. And I put my hope and my trust and my faith in them and they fail. And then my heart is broken. What do we expect from them? Listen, I understand it's, it's, you trust leaders, you believe in people, uh, you, you, you count on people, people are reliable, but we have to understand that people change, people go, people leave, people fail you, but God is the one that if we put our faith and our hope and our trust, and he is the only one that can never let us down. You save yourself from heartache and heartbreak when you remember that the one you should be trusting first, the one you should be serving first is God. It's better to serve God. It's better to serve God. The second thing is that it's better to serve a few. And I say it like this, Jesus humbly served his friends. Jesus humbly served his friends. There's an incredible passage of scripture that I want to read to you. It's found in John 13, verses 1 through 17. The Bible says this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Later on, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then the Lord, uh, then Lord Simon replied, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. Verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not, not, everyone, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand why I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. He's establishing the order here, the, the, the leader over, over all of them. Now that I have washed your feet, I'm lowering myself. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. See, the foot washing had multiple, had multiple meanings all wrapped into one. Sometimes, um, and, and it, as, I, as I began reading this text and early on in the years, I always wondered why Jesus refused to wash his head, his hands, his whole body. It's because the, the ceremonial washing that Peter's referring to is an image for us of salvation. It's a, it's, it's a process that Jewish people went through infrequently. It was something that happened uh, not all the time. But however, their feet, because especially of the conditions in which they lived, dirt roads, uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have like Air Jordans and, or like, you know, Chelsea boots to walk around. And their feet would be very, very dirty. And so they had to constantly wash their feet as opposed to the rest of their body. And so the, the, the image of the, the whole bathing is the image of salvation for us. And just like Christ dying on the cross, that's once and for all. So you don't need to constantly re-ask to be re-saved. Man, if, if God's got a hold of your life, he won't let go. That's one thing you can take confidence in today is once God got a hold of you, there's nothing you can do. There's nowhere you can run. You can't outrun his grace and his mercy because he's a good God who holds on. But the foot washing represents the constant repentance and the relationship of maintenance and, and, uh, with us and God. And so as the feet need to be washed regularly, so do we need to return to God in prayer. So do we need to return and repent and, and, and to check in and refresh our relationship because things get dirty, things get complicated. And so this is what Jesus is illustrating for them. But also it's another opportunity for Jesus to lower himself before them and demonstrate for them what it looks like to, to lower themselves. So Jesus now gets low. 
He, he's putting the, the upside down kingdom on display. He's, he's, he gets up from the table, he removes his clothing, he lowers himself and he begins to wash their feet. Typically the foot washing was a, a, a responsibility of a servant and Jesus is posturing himself in that, that very, very place. He makes this willful decision to walk, them, to walk with them through their mess, to walk with them through their dirt. This is what Jesus is doing. You know, what's interesting is that Jesus then tells them, you do this for each other as well too. Jesus could have led with that. He could have said, wash each other's feet. And if Jesus says it, you should do it. Yeah. <laughs> However, Jesus said to them, look, look at me do this first. Let, watch me get low. Allow me to walk you through this process. Not, I won't allow you to just, to just flail out on your own and figure this out by yourself. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to lean in with you. I'm going to get dirty with you. I'm going to be in process with you. I'm going to be with you through this process. It, it reminds me of uh, this past weekend. I got to run my, my very first half marathon. And um, this is the medal that they gave me for enduring all of my uh, hardships. And I, I've been wearing this thing like all week. So very, very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. Probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was uh, run this half marathon. I got a couple of pictures we'll throw up, um, a couple of action shots, big smile on my face, stride. That's, that's somewhere around like mile four or five where I was feeling good, feeling myself you know, like right around that 1030 pace, you know, nice and easy and uh, feeling great. Um, but right around mile six and a half, seven, I started getting this crazy knee pain that um, I was not prepared for. And I had to slow down quite a bit, but I made it. I have the metal to prove it. It was painful. It was challenging. It was grueling. Uh, my, my mind was tested as much as my body was. And the, I've got the two best moments of the race was this first one I have a video of. I'm, I'm running, I can see the finish line. And then um, it's, like the, it's like not even an eighth of a mile and I'm struggling, I'm hurting, I'm limping. I'm pretending like I got a smile on my face, but I see that finish line and I, they got pizza at the end of the finish line. And as I'm going, as I'm running, as I'm trucking along, all of a sudden, the best little moment happens is my little boy comes running towards me and he's proud of me and he wants to finish the race with me. And so he runs with me all the way through the end of the finish line. And I don't know if it was the pain or the excitement, but I just burst into tears. It was ugly cry, all the things that people hate about crying in public. Um, but that was such a sweet moment that uh, we got to finish the race together. And um, I was so excited about that. But there's a different moment that I want to turn your attention to. And I want to actually change the perspective on that was really why I think I finished this race. Check this out. There goes me and Levi running. And we're making it across the finish line. And just for a second, the camera pans right back towards that guy. That's Kenny. Kenny's one of our worship leaders at our Spotsy location. And uh, he might be walking there, but Kenny's like a gazelle. Yeah. Come on. That boy runs like the wind. And this is my first half marathon, but Kenny's run a ton of them and decided to run with me. You know, he could have lapped me. He could have dusted me. He could have took off. He could have ran a whole lot faster than I was running. But Kenny decided within himself that he was going to go with me, that he wasn't going to let me just flail out there by myself, that he wasn't going to have me walk through this process for the first time by myself. He chose to slow down, to get into the rain and the cold with me, and to make sure that I had the encouragement that I needed to get across the finish line. Kenny served me. He served me. And he served me in a way that I was not expecting that I would ever need. I had every intention to run this race all by myself. 
but it changed something when someone who had been there before, who was ready to walk with you through that entire process. And Kenny did that for me. It's better to serve. It's better to serve. I don't know, maybe I would have quit. Maybe I would have asked for the, the, the pickup truck to come and get me, <laughs> to come and help me limp off the rest of that, that, uh, that course. But he helped me finish my run. And we have the opportunity when we serve to help people get across the finish line in every season of their life. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody say it's better to serve. It's better to serve. It's better to serve. The last thing, Jesus willingly served the world. It's better to serve all. Everything we read about Jesus in the gospels is considered his public ministry. It's literally Jesus serving. It's him serving the people of ancient Israel. He's giving sight to the blind. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's raising the dead. He's feeding thousands. He's teaching thousands. This was Jesus' service to the people of Israel. He made every moment of the last three years of his life about service until the very end. I love that Philippians 2 says this, have this mind about yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. The name that's above every name put himself below every name. He humbled himself to a cross and served us all. Because that was the command from the Father and now the Son gives the command to all of us to serve, to serve. See, I believe there's, there's three people in the room today. There's three people in the room today, I believe this. The first group, you're all in, you're all in. You're serving, Jesus has touched your life and you're just giving all you got to see people meet Jesus. And I just wanna tell you humbly on, on behalf of our pastors, and I really, I believe I'm, I speak for the Lord in this. We're so proud of you. You're crushing it, keep going, don't stop. You're making a difference beyond what you can see. The things that you do see and beyond what you can even see, you're making a difference. Keep going. The application for you is to not grow weary in well-doing. The second group is you have been served salvation by Jesus. And you're sitting on your hands. You can serve, but there is a list of excuses. The kids, the job. The, the responsibilities, the coaching, the family, the, the, the anxiety, the frustration, the depression, the hurt. You've got a list of reasons why you can't. But let me tell you, if you were to start to count your blessings and remember the goodness and faithfulness of God, that list will start getting exponentially longer and it will make this other list pale in comparison. And it's time for you to get off your hands and get those hands on the net. Outside of your auditorium today, to every location, we got an environment that you can go find a way to get your hands on the net. You can join a team. And I, listen, I don't want you just to serve for like a week or two, serve on Easter and be done. I, I want you to find something that brings fulfillment to your life. And I'm telling you, if you just for a moment, just find a way to make something not about yourself. You start to empty yourself out. You might find that this is really what living is. This is really what living is. And so you walk out of this auditorium today and you tell somebody at that table, it's better to serve. And they're gonna know what you're talking about. And they're gonna help you find a place that you can put your hands on the net, hands on vision, hands on life change. And you're gonna find out it truly is better to serve. That's your application today. And there's a third group of people here today is that today's your day to be served by Jesus. Today's your day to place your hope and your faith in the King who is the God of service. 
Come on, why don't we, we bow our heads and close our eyes at every location, no one looking around but me. If that's you today, I want to know who you are. I want to, I want to pray with you. I want, to, I want our campus pastors at every location uh, to know who you are so we can come alongside you in prayer in this moment. You're, you know it's you. You've been thinking about this moment for a long time. Maybe your hands are trembling and your breathing, your breathing's gotten a little short. It's because I believe the Holy Spirit is whispering, come to me, to you right now. You see, Jesus, the Jesus that we speak of, he lived 33 years on this earth, lived the perfect life and died a death that all of us deserved, but none of us could afford the cost of, but didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later and served us salvation to whoever would call upon his name. And today that can be, today is your day. You can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And I want to pray with you. Listen, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's not a magic trick. It's you placing your faith in Jesus. He'll give you a brand new future. He'll give you a new start and he'll give you a home in heaven. If that's you today, I want to encourage you to lift up your hand in this room on the count of three. No one's going to be looking around. No one's going to come to you. No one's going to bother you. No one's going to, no one's going to disturb you. But I'll know, and the Lord will know, and we'll pray together. So on the count of three, if that's you, I want you to slip your hand. One, two, three. Hands going up all across the room. I believe at every location, hands are going up. Keep them up just for a minute so we can see them. Your campus pastor can see them. Keep them up just for a minute. Amen. Hey, you could put those down just for a minute. I want to pray for you. And as you pray this prayer from your heart to God's heart, I believe Jesus will be your savior. Light point, come on. Why don't we pray together for the benefit of those who are praying this for the very first time. Say, Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that you are the savior. Come into my life. I accept your free gift of salvation. And with your help, I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together for everybody that made that decision today. Amen.